Uh, so we are uh, in the fifth week of our series. We took a little break while we were on the fall retreat, but we're in the fifth week of our series, Forgotten God. And we've just been talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, the reason we've been doing this is because I believe, and uh, I've been in church uh, well, since I was one week old, because my dad's a pastor, and uh, so uh, no, I was literally I was born on a Sunday, and then I was in church the next Sunday, and I've, I've kind of never stopped, and um, that's why I'm so messed up. That's why I need so much therapy. Um, but uh, 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 we, 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 in my experience with church and with Christians and just being around church people all my life, um, I've just made an observation over time, and that is that the Holy Spirit is the most neglected member of the Godhead of the Trinity. Um, now, maybe you come from a tradition that was way different than mine. Maybe you come from like a super hyper Pentecostal tradition where all you ever talked about was the Holy Spirit. And that's like, and maybe you're like, well, we talked about the Holy Spirit too much. We didn't talk about Jesus enough. And that's fine. But like in, in most, I, I think in most evangelical churches, or maybe you were raised Catholic or whatever it might be, but I, I, I think that we talk a lot about God. I mean, everybody talks about God, even non Christians uh, talk about God. Um, or the universe, or whatever, um, and a lot of a lot of people will talk about Jesus in church. I mean, that's a good idea to talk about Jesus. Um, but then I just feel like a lot of times we leave out this third member. Uh, he's one God, but he's three persons somehow, and we don't understand that. It's a divine mystery, but we believe that that God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so I just wanted to take some time to just kind of stop and think about that and experience this and, and, to want, and to ask ourselves for our own lives, you know what, do I, do I really know who the Holy Spirit is in my life? Do I really have his power and his presence? And um, do I really know who he is? And, uh, you know, when you read your Bible, the story of the Bible, who, well, uh, you know what, that, that would be embarrassing. I was going to ask who has read through their Bible completely to raise their hands, but then the rest of you would feel bad. So just if you've ever read through the whole Bible... <laughs> It's okay. If you've ever read through the whole Bible, you see this sweeping story from Genesis to Revelation. And the story, in my opinion, is that God is forming a people. I mean, if you take it from Genesis all the way through, in Genesis you see Adam and Eve, the first man and woman created, and then you, you get to this guy named Abraham, and God comes to Abraham, he's like, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, I'm going to make a, a special people, a peculiar people, a holy people, and these people are going to bless the nations of the world, they're going to bless the world, and that's going to start with you, Abraham, and then you keep going through the Old Testament, you come across Moses, and then David, and Solomon, and, and then you get to the prophets, Isaiah. Isaiah and Amos and Habakkuk, and it keeps going through, and God is calling people to be part of this special family. He's calling people to join in this peculiar holy people that in the Old Testament were called the Jews, and in the New Testament is called the church. It's called Christians. You get into the New Testament, and Jesus comes, and now God is calling not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. That's, that's us, okay? That's non-Jews. He's calling everyone to come be part of this peculiar people, this people that you read through the Bible, the whole plan has always been God forming a people and, and, and a people who are going to bless the world, a people who are going to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, who are going to love their neighbors as themselves, and as they do that, they're going to be a blessing to the nations. And now we're part of that. We're part of that family. We're part of that peculiar family people. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, you might want to pull this up. It's not going to be on the screen, all right? So you're going to have to pull it up and actually read it for yourself today. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Ephesians 4, is in the, it's in the New Testament. Um, go to your table of contents if you need to. That's fine. Uh, I have to do that myself a lot. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 6. Paul says, the Bible says there is one body, okay, one family, and one spirit, the Holy Spirit, just as you were called the one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And then Paul later tells the, the Galatians in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, you don't have to turn there, I mean, I know that's a lot of flipping, but, uh, but Galatians chapter 4, Paul also writes, he says, because you are his sons and daughters, because you are his sons and daughters, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, which literally, like if you translate that in the English, it means Daddy, God. Daddy, God. Abba, Father. So you are no longer slaves, but God's children. 
And since you are his children, he has made you also heirs, heirs of this family, heirs of his kingdom. And, you know, when we read these verses, this, this is an amazing truth that I think a lot of us just don't grasp. We don't get it for us and our lives. I, I can't fully explain what this means, but I know that I've experienced it in quiet moments with God and those times that I've had really just personal experiences with God. I have, I have got a glimpse of what this means to be called God's child and to have his spirit within me. This is one of those incredible gifts that is given by the Holy Spirit. This is by the Holy Spirit. He is the one who assures us that we're God's children. He's the one that assures us you're no longer slaves. You no longer have the spirit of a slave. You have the spirit of a son or a daughter of the Most High God. He is the one who gives us this confidence. And without his presence and without his work in our lives, we're going to live a lot of our Christian lives feeling like, am I in or am I out? You know, am I really one of God's children, or am I doing this right? And, and what we do is that we, we start to try harder, and we start to work harder, and we start to think, well, I've got to be better. Listen, you don't need to be better. You need to be loved. You need to know that you are loved by God, and the only way that you really know that in your heart is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who comes and just assures us and gives us confidence to know that we are sons and daughters of God. And so I guess my question for you this morning is, do you know this? Do you know this in your heart, that you are a son or a daughter of God? Do you have this kind of relationship with God? Or are you just like trying to do better, striving to work harder, trying to make yourself, you know, have this kind of, trying to manufacture this kind of relationship with God. Listen, you can't manufacture this. You can't fake your way to this. This is just a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people that I know and I talk to aren't really sure of where they stand with God, even though they say, you know what, I'm a Christian, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose from the grave for my sins, and I, I believe these things, but I just, I just don't really know it in my heart. And I think that's a tragedy. I think that's so sad that we would live our lives calling ourselves Christians but never really knowing or feeling or experiencing God's love for us. And we, we, we continue to live a, a Christian experience like a, with the spirit of a slave instead of the spirit of a son or a daughter of God. This is the confidence that the Holy Spirit gives us. And I just want you to think about this today. Do you know this for your life? Do you have this confidence in your heart that I am a son or a daughter of God? Um, just to let you guys know, my, you know a little bit of, of, of my story, um, like I said, I've been in church a long time, and so I've always been around church and Christians, and, um, and, and I think maybe because of that, I, the gospel has always seemed kind of ordinary to me. And it's only in like the past few years that I've really just been like, wow, <laughs> God loves me. Like, I'm a wretch. I'm a terrible person. I can't do anything right. And God, the God of the universe, the God who flung the stars into space, and the God who said, let there be light, and there was light, that God loves me, and he calls me his son. For most of my life, I was just kind of in this spiral of trying harder and trying to be good, and I came to the point where I realized, I, okay, you know what? You're not good, Stephen. You're not good. You need the grace of God just like anybody else. And I told people for years and years that I knew God. I knew God. Yeah, I know God. I know Jesus. I know these things. But I, I only think that recently I've, I've really started to understand what it is to be known by God. Not just that I know about God, but that I know God and God knows me. And that's, that's just an amazing picture when you think about it that that God would be like, I know Stephen Collins. He's my son. He's my child. I know that guy, and I love him. And I just wonder, for, for so many of you, are you confident that God would say that about you if I asked him? I was like, God, what do you, what do you think about, and put your name there, are you confident that he would say, oh, yeah, I know. That's my son. That's my daughter. Or do you, do you not have that 
confidence? Do you not have that knowledge? Do you, do you know about God or do you know God? Many of us would say, yeah, I'm a child of God, but those are just empty words for us. We say it, but we don't know it. Can you say with confidence from the depth of your being, from the deepest part of your heart, that you know God and that God knows you? Paul talked about this in Romans, Romans chapter 8. If you want to flip there, you might want to just write it down. This would be a good one to read this, this coming week in your quiet time with God. If you have a quiet time, I'll, I'll challenge you with that here in just a second. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Paul says, listen, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness himself with our spirit that we are children of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul says, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit bears witness to our spirits that we are the children of God. What does it? Who does it? The Holy Spirit does. And if you're not really clear on who the Holy Spirit is for you, then you might go your whole life and not really know, I am a child of God. So I don't know where you are with all that this morning. I just kind of say all that because I just, I've been around church a lot, I've been around church people, I've been around Christians, and I just, for myself, it's only been in the last few years that I'm getting this. And I just wonder where you are. Maybe, and I don't know, maybe you're like, no, I get it, That's, I didn't even need to be here today. I know that. But maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe, there, maybe you're tracking 100% and you're like, yes, I know. And if that's you, then I would just say, you know what, say amen. And, and, and you know, say, God, thank you for this. I'm glad I have this confidence. But if you don't, if you don't have this confidence, if you don't have this kind of relationship with God, a real relationship, this kind of intimacy where, where your heart cries out, Daddy God, not far off, distant God, but Daddy God. If that's where you are, then I would like to offer you a couple of reasons why that might be. Uh, I don't have like a four-step program for you to receive the Holy Spirit, all right? But what I do have is a couple of reasons that, um, that I think a lot of us don't have this kind of relationship with God, and we don't have this confidence. Um, and, and I do want you to really pay attention to this because um, Francis Chan talks about this in his book, Forgotten God, that your life groups are going through, and so you'll dig into this later this week. Um, and he, he's from L.A., and so he's writing from the perspective of, of a guy from L.A., but I, I, see, this in, I see this in you guys. I, I see some of this, if I can just be honest, I'm not slamming our church or anything, I see this in some of you. And I want you to hear this from the heart of your pastor, okay? Um, one of the biggest obstacles that many of us have when it comes to having a real relationship with God is comfort. Comfort. Some of you, your life is too safe. Your Christian experience is too safe. And for me, like I know that I, I have felt closest to God when I have felt the least safe and secure. I have felt closest to God in moments when I didn't know what to do, and I was faced with something that I didn't have the answer for. All right, uh, like I mean, just for example, when, when um, uh, three years ago, when, when Mandy and I came out here to, uh, and I, I came to be your pastor, and uh, you know, there, there was a time there, uh, a period of nine months when I was in between churches, and I wasn't sure where God was going to take us next. You know, we're from Ohio, so to come out here was kind of crazy. And, um, and, and so we, we, we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and during those nine months, we were like, God, where, where do you want us to go? Where, where were you? Just open a door. We don't know. And, and for like six months, it was just like God was silent. It was just like we didn't hear anything, and there were no doors opening. And I, I was getting desperate. Because, I'm, I mean, as a guy, and we, and we were newlyweds too, okay? So this was all happening about the time that we got married. And, 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 and as a new husband, I'm like, you know what? I, I need a job. Like, I need to provide for my wife. And I, this is what I went to school for. And all these loans are, are due. And, 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 and so I got a couple of seasonal jobs where I was working in a factory and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is, this is, this is a job, but this isn't my calling. What, God just opened a door. For six months, we didn't hear anything. 
nothing. And it was at that point of when I, I finally reached the end of my rope about seven months in, and I just said, God, I give up. I give up. If you're going to do something, you're going to do it, but I'm not praying about it anymore. <laughs> that's dangerous to do. I don't recommend that. I'm not saying that's good theology, but that's how I felt. Have you ever been there? Like, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been there in your life where you're just like, I'm not praying about that anymore. God's not answering. I got there. I got to that point, and it was just like this point where I just kind of let go of all of it. And two months later, we were here. <laughs> and, but, and things didn't start to happen until I'd let it go, until I'd reached that point where it wasn't safe, and I'd given up my comfort, and I'd given up my security, and just been like, you know what, God, do what you want to do. Open a door if you're going to open it. I can't control this situation. For many of us, our lives are too safe and too comfortable. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. For a lot of us, you know, we, we say that, oh yeah, you know, God placed me in Fairwood, or God placed me in Renton, or Fife, or where, you know, wherever I live. God, God's placed me, um, God's placed me here. But for many of us, that's almost a cop out. We say that because our houses are nice and our cars are nice and we have a good job. And our lives are so comfortable. A lot of times people ask me, like, Stephen, why why do you why do you think we don't see more like miracles? Why do, why do you think we don't see God moving in ways that we hear about in other countries? And I would say, first of all, that well, we do see miracles. We just tend to not acknowledge them as such. But secondly, I would say that for most of us, we live our lives, even most of us Christians, we live our lives as though we don't really need God because we're comfortable. Things are comfortable and secure for us, and we haven't really reached that point of desperation where all we have is God. Listen, when God is all you have, that's a powerful place to be. That's a powerful place to be. So Jesus calls the Holy Spirit our comforter, right? We've talked about that in this series. He says, I will send the comforter. Why would you need a comforter if your life is already comfortable? Many of you, your life is so comfortable, you don't think you need a comfortable, or you don't need a comforter. It's those who put their lives at risk for the gospel. It's those who suffer for the gospel who will experience this kind of intimate relationship with Jesus. In his book, Forgotten God, Francis Chan writes this. I just want to read a little paragraph for you. He says, uh, I recently had dinner in Seoul, Korea with an amazing man. He was one of the 23 missionaries who were held hostage by the Taliban in Afghanistan in July 2007. For those who don't recall the story, the Taliban executed two of the missionaries before a deal was reached with the government of South Korea and the missionaries were released. This man told me about the horrors of being locked up in a cell knowing that martyrdom was a strong possibility. He also shared about the amazing time they had on the last day when they were all imprisoned together. Their captives had later divided them into groups of three and took them to remote areas. Each of the 23 missionaries surrendered their lives to God that night and told God that they were willing to die for his glory. There was even an argument about who should die first. Wow. <laughs> who should die first? One of them had a small Bible that the missionaries secretly ripped into 23 pieces so that they could each get a glance at Scripture when no one was watching. The Word of God and the Spirit of God got them through the first 40 days of imprisonment. And one of the most fascinating things this man told me was about what happened after that. Now that they've been back in Seoul for a few years, several team members have asked him, don't you wish we were still there? Don't you wish we were still imprisoned for our faith? He tells me that several of them experienced a deep kind of intimacy with God in the prison cell that they haven't been able to recapture. This is the gift of intimacy that the Holy Spirit gives us. It's a security that is priceless and worth any loss of safety or comfort. For some of you, your lives are just too comfortable. Second thing, one thing is comfort. That's one obstacle. Second thing is volume. Maybe your life is too loud. Maybe you, you know what I'm saying? Got one of these in your pocket? Reading your Bible right now, multitasking on it? That's fine. I mean, this is a great tool, but like multitasking is the norm now. 
Like I, I have literally been, like I, I go to Starbucks a lot for, uh, for work because we don't have a physical building, so that's like my office. And so um, I'll go and I, I will literally, at, at times, it's like normal for me now to have my phone out texting somebody, have my laptop open working on something, have my iPad sitting next to it looking up something else, and uh, you know, have my headphones on listening to music all at once. It's normal. It's normal now. When was the last time that you had uninterrupted conversation with somebody? No phones, no text messages, no to-do lists running through your mind. It's so rare these days to have no distractions. I, uh, Friday, I uh, had my, took my day off on Friday, and uh, I went uh, out to the woods again. I, I just like the woods. And I, I went all over the north side of, of Cougar Mountain, and uh, I turned my phone off. And I didn't take anything else with me. I just took some water and a little bit of food and just walked around. And before I knew it, four and a half hours were just gone. I just walked all over the north side of that mountain. And, uh, and you know, every once in a while, I would stop. It was just like this. You know, there was nothing. There was no sound. There was no distraction. There was no notification on my phone coming through. There was no text message. There was no, there was no distractions. And I mean, I left after that time away, and I just felt refreshed in my soul. And I felt closer to God. And I felt ready to go back and face the rest of the week. And I know that for some of you, that sounds like an impossibility. You're like, well, you know, I've got kids at home. I can't get away for four hours. Well, I, you know, that, that's fine, but I wonder, could you get away for, for 20 minutes after you put the kids to bed? Or could you get up before the kids are getting ready for school? Or you know, could you get up a little bit early for 20 minutes and just spend some quiet time alone with God, just you and your Bible? Could you do that? See, it takes effort to do this. It takes a little bit of work to quiet your mind and your soul and just be still before God. That means turning off your TV, turning off your phone, uh, turning off the music, turning off everything and just being still before God. It might mean going outside to your favorite spot, or it might be, you know, like literally making a spot in your walk-in closet where the kids aren't allowed to come in, right? It might, be, might mean doing something like that. I don't know what this looks like exactly for you, but I do know that many of you are way too busy. I've told you guys before that you're uh, moving to the Seattle area has been, uh, the, the biggest culture shock to me coming from the Midwest is just how busy we are. And how, you know, I've, I've had to schedule coffee meetings with some of you two weeks ahead of time because you're always running and you're always doing and you're always something with your kids or something with your work or something with this organization or that. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be involved in all of that. You're a good parent. You're a good, uh, you're a good Christian. But man, have you been quiet before God lately? Have you been quiet before your creator? Have you, have you been still and just known that he is God. Guys, it's important. Many of you are, are too, too busy. So I want us to do something kind of weird right now. Um, I've never done this before. Um, I want you to turn off your phones, um, and, and like literally, not just um, do not disturb mode. I want you to turn off your phones. For some of you, this is gonna, I mean, this is like, uh, you know, punching a baby. Um, but I want you to turn it off. I'm gonna do mine too, look. I'm going to do mine too. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm powering it. Okay, powering it down. Yeah, it's a little. A little uh, my finger didn't want to do it. I think, no. Okay, so we've got them off, right? You're not connected right now. I don't know. You might have your Bibles on there. You know, I just just for a second, okay? Um, and and what I want us to do is I, I want all of us to just close our eyes, and I want us to be still for 60 seconds. I'll keep the time. Okay, I want you to be still and just silent for 60 seconds. Okay, are we ready? Everybody got their phones off? All right, let's begin. And when you're, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to di disrupt it. When you're done, just look up at me. When you think 60 seconds has gone by, okay, so go.
Texas. How many of you were keeping time, weren't you? You were counting. <laughs> yes, there's 60 seconds. Was that, um, was that weird for any of you? Just to like listen to the silence for a second or a minute? Is that weird? Did you have like an itch to check your Facebook or, you know, check your email or see if you got a text? Was that weird? Because, see, like if you had trouble just sitting still for that minute, I guarantee you your life is too loud. Volume. Volume. One of the best things I do in my own life, and I mean, again, this isn't to like say that, okay, I'm, I'm the best and you, no, but like for my own walk with God, I have to stay close to God. It's, it's easy for, like I said, for those things that are holy to become ordinary to me. And so one of the best things that I've discovered for myself is just to get away for an afternoon, turn everything off, and it'll be there when you come back. It'll be there when you come back. Some of you are too busy. Your life is too loud. Others of you are too comfortable. Your life is too comfortable. I'll give you a verse to get you started on this. Those of you who say, you know what, I think that would be a good idea, maybe to spend 20 minutes in the morning. Maybe you could do that in the morning as the kids are getting ready. I'll even get you started. Because some of you might be like, well, you know what, I don't know. I don't even know how to read my Bible. I don't even know how to, how to I don't even know how I, would, how I would do a quiet time with God. I've, I've, never, I've never done it. Listen, um, I'll help get you started. What you do is you just take your Bible and you start reading it. <laughs> All right? And uh, you start reading it, and, and you know what happens as you read your Bible? Your Bible starts reading you. You start being shaped by what you're reading. So um, what I would like you to do this coming week is to just commit to spending some quiet time each day with God. Maybe it's before the kids are up. Maybe it's after the kids are in bed. But I just want to read you John 14, verses 15 through 17. You might want to jot that down so you can do it or bookmark it in your phone. Um, oh, you, did anybody turn their phones back on already? You know, is it, was it that hard? See, uh, John 14, 15 through 17, I'm reading from the message translation. What you do is you get alone and you get quiet and you just begin to read and meditate and, and, and ask God, what, what does this mean for me, Father? Holy Spirit, what does, what does this mean for, for me? Um, Jesus says this, he says, if you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the Father and he'll provide you another friend so that you will always have someone with you. The friend, this friend, is the spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him, doesn't know what to look for, but you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, will be in you. So you might want to take that and just use that in your time alone with God this week and meditate on that. Remember, uh, Jesus said it was better this way. Jesus said it was better that he go away and the Holy Spirit come. It was better for him to leave and to send the comforter, to send the other counselor. After all, Jesus just walked around with his disciples as a man, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he could be within each of us, dwell within each of us one of us. And you've probably heard this a hundred times, but I just want you to hear it again. You are not God, but God is in you. All right? You are not God, but God is in you. This is not a loose, distant connection. This is the spirit of the living God coming and taking up residence within you. That means that as I, as I put together a sermon every week, as I uh, go in and, and, and spend time with people, as you take your kids to school, as you're going to your kids' soccer practice, as you're going to work, as you're working in your cubicle, or you're on your flight, or you're teaching, or you're homeschooling your kids, the Spirit of God is living within you. And he's working within you. You are being indwelled by the very Spirit who created the world. He is in you, and so because of that, when you're uh, uh, going through something tough at work or in just in your life, when you're stressed or when you feel like you're stretched to your breaking point, you don't have to let that define your life. You don't have to let that define your day. What defines your life and your day is that the Spirit of God is living within you. If you've received by faith 
the promise of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you are his temple. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit every day. Whatever you're doing, as you buy groceries, as you get coffee, as you give in relationships, as you walk the dog, as you make decisions, as you just live your life, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. Please don't let this just slip past you. I know that many of us would say, yeah, I know that, but do you know this? Don't let this just slip past you like a trivia question for your Bible quiz later. All right, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not just a person living your life by your own power. The Spirit of God is in you. And this is why Jesus said it was better for him to go and the Holy Spirit to come. Don't just walk away from this unchanged. Don't just walk away from this, delve into this. Meditate on this, let this impact you at the deepest level of your spirit. Don't just leave and say, yeah, I, I, I know. No, really come to believe this and know this in your heart of hearts. Do you want to know how important this is? I, I just, here's how important it is. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 that Jesus, Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us so that we might receive the promised gift of the Holy Spirit through faith. Now, I'm sure I've read that verse before. Maybe, maybe you've read that verse before. But listen, do you realize what it's saying here? Do you really know the promised spirit? This is not just a small promise. Jesus suffered a grueling, terrible death so that you could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How dare we take that for granted? Jesus suffered and died, the Bible says, so that we might have this spirit living within us. Because of Jesus, we have received this promise. And this isn't just a remote force. This isn't just like, oh, this is a universe type thing. This is a personal God taking up residence within us in our very bodies. And when we accept him by faith, that's what gives us confidence to know that we're sons and daughters of God. That's how we know we're in, if you will. That's how we know we're in the family. That's how we know we're going to heaven. It's by the Holy Spirit giving us that confidence that we are the children of God. It's not about just having an impersonal guardian that kind of looks over you. It's about knowing a personal parent, all right? Abba, Father. Daddy God, that's the most intimate term that a Hebrew child could call their dad. Papa, Abba, Daddy. And the Bible says that that is the kind of relationship that the Holy Spirit enables us to have with God. As God's Spirit begins to work on us and speak to our hearts, we can call out, Daddy God and we'll begin to experience a real relationship with God that isn't just a head knowledge, that isn't just a Sunday morning thing, but is an every moment thing. As we walk with him, as we love him, and we'll start to wonder, man, does everybody know that they're loved by God like this? Does everybody know that they are loved by God like this? Some of you guys have trouble talking about your faith to people. You have trouble sharing your faith and, and you know, having those faith conversations. Listen, when you know that you're loved like this, when you have this confidence before God, you'll, you'll, you'll just be like, man, why doesn't everybody know this? I want to tell other people about this. If you have trouble sharing your faith, maybe it's because you don't really have this relationship with God yourself. Maybe it's because either your life is too loud or your life is too comfortable and you don't know him as your papa, God, the Spirit speaks truth to our hearts. The Bible says again in Romans 8, 1, that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Do you know that? Do you know it? The Holy Spirit is what gives you confidence of that. And God said to his people Israel in the Old Testament, as he was still forming that peculiar people that the Bible talks about, that family of God, he, he says to, to them in Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And so I just want to leave you guys with this question.
question today. When is the last time you sought after God with your whole heart? When is the last time you got rid of all the clutter and all the busyness and all of the comfort and just were still before God and sought him with all your heart? Because God still desires to be sought and found by his people, and that's you. So ask the Holy Spirit. If you don't have this kind of relationship with God, ask the Holy Spirit to just give you the ability to set everything else aside so that you can seek God with all your heart. Tell God that you want this relationship with him. You want to know this kind of intimacy with him as your Papa God, even if it means that you're not comfortable anymore, even if it means suffering, even if it means you know getting uncomfortable and turning off your phone and putting in the work to get that alone, quiet time with God, tell him that you want that and seek him with all your heart. And guys, I'm telling you, when you have this kind of relationship, this, this is the way it should be. This is the way it should be. And when you have this, there is nothing in life that is more satisfying or more meaningful than this kind of relationship with God. And many of us, even those of us who follow Jesus, do we have this? Do you have this? What I want to do to close us today is I actually want to pray over you guys. So um, I want you to, uh, maybe you could, uh, could just uh, bow in your seat. If you want to kneel on the floor, that's fine. But I actually want to just pray over you that you would experience this kind of relationship with God, that you would seek God with all your heart and that the Holy Spirit would give you confidence in this. So, uh, Heavenly Father, we, we come before you today as a peculiar people, as a, a people who are sons and daughters of God. And we have received this spirit of adoption uh, by the work of Jesus and by your Holy Spirit within us. And I just pray right now for each and every person in this room that we would seek this kind of relationship with our Creator. Lord, I pray for those whose lives are too comfortable. Lord, I pray that you would discomfort them. I pray that you would get us out of our comfort zones to be able to trust you more and to seek after you harder. Lord, I pray for those of us whose lives are too loud, that are too busy, that are always multitasking. Lord, I pray that you would help us to just quiet our souls before you, that we would really be still and know that you are God. I pray that you would help us to make the time this week in the morning or in the evening, whenever it might be, to be alone and be still before you and to let you search us and know us, O oh God. Lord, I pray, I pray that, you would, that you would give us hearts that seek after you. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would change our hearts today. I pray that we wouldn't just be content with a head knowledge of who Jesus is or who the Holy Spirit is or who God the Father is, but I pray that from this day that we would begin to seek you with all our hearts because we know that as we do that, we will find you. So Lord, I, just, I, I ask that you would be near to each person right now. I pray that you would convict them of their sin. Lord, if there's things in their lives that aren't pleasing to you, if there's something that they know they need to get rid of so that they're not so busy or that, so that life isn't so loud or if there's some, something that's comfortable that they've been holding on to that keeps them from you, I pray that you would convict them of that sin right now, that you would just grab a hold of their hearts and say, give this to me, give this to me, and I pray that we would just release it to you right now and that this coming week, every day, we would seek after you with all of our hearts because we want to know this kind of relationship with our Father. We don't want to just have a head knowledge. We want to know. So Holy Spirit, we just, we receive you now. We ask that you would do a new work in us and that we wouldn't be content to settle for anything else. We love you and we thank you. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.